My name is Pamela Karimi. I'm an Associate Professor of Arts History. This grand project is led in collaboration with the New Bedford Historical Society. Since the majestic work of June Manning Thomas, Race, Racism, and Race Relations, Linkage with Urban and Regional Planning, a book that was published in 1997, we have seen a growing body of literature on race and architecture. However, this scholarship has focused mostly on the dark side of such built environments. Lacking is an in-depth exploration of the architectonics of interracial neighborhoods. New Bedford, the home of many fugitive slaves, abolitionists, Cape Verdeans, and African Americans, provides a lens through which to study interracial aspects of American cities throughout history. Through a lecture series, a documentary film, and an exhibition, titled Black Spaces Matter, exploring the aesthetics and architectonics of an abolitionist neighborhood, which will take place at the McCormick Gallery at the Boston Architectural College next year. We hope to highlight the architectural features of this rich, rich neighborhood, along with the stories attached to it. But our lecture series, film, and exhibition have a greater goal than just highlighting the material culture and architecture of an interracial neighborhood from a bygone era. We want to highlight the significance of African American heritage today. We want to explore the very many ways in which architecture and urban design can contribute to the peaceful coexistence of different communities. We hope that our project can become a source of inspiration for imagining a better life for current and future generations. To this end, we have included the voices of scholars who reflect on contemporary issues, and today we have the honor of introducing one of these voices to our UMass Dartmouth community. Cesar McDowell is a professor of the practice of community development at MIT. He holds his degree in education and psychology from Harvard University. Caesar's current work is on the development of community knowledge systems and civic engagement. He is also expanding his critical moments reflection methodology to identify, to identify, share, and maintain grassroots knowledge. His research and teaching interests also include the use of mass media and technology in promoting democracy and community building the education of urban students, the development and use of empathy in community work, civil rights history, peacemaking, and conflict resolution. He is the director of the global civic engagement organization, Dropping Knowledge International, co-founder of the Civil Rights Forum on Telecommunications Policy, and a founding board member of the Algebra Projects. The title of Caesar's today's talk is The Struggle That Is Democracy, Perspectives from Architecture and Urban Planning. Today, Caesar will talk about how cities and towns across the world are comprised of the most demographically complex set of people who have ever lived together. This demographically complex public, as we all know, is often fractured, divided, and in many cases even in conflict. In this lecture, Professor Mansoul will offer reflections on what it will take to stitch together this fractured, complex community and build more just and truly democratic communities. Professor Mansoul. Uh, I'm going to talk for a while, and then I'm hoping what we will do is have a conversation about these things. Uh, and I'm going to talk from a couple of perspectives, one from my uh, work at MIT, but mostly from my work in practice and what I've been doing and what I uh, have kind of learned from that. So I will speak at a kind of broad level, but then we're in the question and answer period. If there are really specific examples that people want me to bring forward, I can do that uh, so you know where things are coming from. Uh, but I want to start actually with one thing. So. Everything you hear from me today actually is kind of grounded in this sentence, this paragraph up here. A belief I have that without the full participation and knowledge of those least served in the world, we cannot find peaceful, sustainable, or equitable solutions to the issues confronting the world. That is a guiding principle. So as I go through this, and you'll see me make some statements and some uh, my own perspective on things is all guided about 
the, what it takes and the necessity of having those who are least served really involved in helping us both understand what's going on in the world and looking for solutions. Show that, vid that video because it kind of I think captures very succinctly and kind of powerfully what's going on in the world right now. Uh, we are our population is growing quite rapidly for lots of reasons. Uh, we are living in cities more than we have before. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but it said there that we would have 25, uh, 21 mega cities. This film was made five years ago. Today there are 35 mega cities. Okay, is it? sense in which urbanization in cities are really a lot of what's going on in the world. But the other thing I think that this video didn't say about the 70% of the people who are going to be living in, in urban areas, of that 70% who are living in urban areas, it's estimated that almost close to 80% of them will actually be poor, underserved by the society that's there. So basically we're going to have uh, a lot of what we see starting to go on in some cities, which is places, pockets of which there are people who are really rich, and a lot of people who aren't so well off. And this is what's happening globally around the world. But I want to kind of turn my attention a little bit about, uh, talk a little bit more, uh, kind of focus the rest of my comments on the U.S., getting a little bit of feedback. But, uh, because one of the things that we know is really true that's happening is that our cities, with all more and more people moving into cities, actually who we're living with and who's in cities is becoming more and more complex, right? That we are becoming a place in which uh, we are living with, as I like to say, the most demographically complex set of people who've ever lived together in the world, right? And the places in which we live, the cities in which we live, have neither the infrastructure nor the processes in place to actually help that public actually do what it needs to do so that the institutions that are there can actually serve them well. 
So as someone who works in the School of Planning but is not a planner, uh, I do this question all the time. My interest is not so much in the art and skill of planning, but in what does it actually take for the public in a democracy to actually have a real voice around forming the spaces that they're going to live in and the institutions that are there to serve them. So, as I said before, cities are really finding themselves in this really uh, strange place that they've never been in before. Right? There's lots of growth going on, lots of different kinds of people. You, know, you kind of walk down the streets in most cities in this country and you can hear several different languages just as you walk down the streets. You go into the schools, and you know, most schools now will tell you, well, we have 30 languages spoken in this school, my students, or 40 languages, whatever it may be. It's a signal of what's to come. And we actually don't know, as I said before, how to live with that kind of complexity. And we don't have, and what I, and I want to, about that, the, about that complexity, one of the things that's really important is that in order for democracy to work, right, the public actually has to be involved. It actually has to have a voice of its own, a collective voice. I'm not talking about fragmented voices from interest groups, but a collective voice that the public has that allows things to function, decisions to be made, policies to be set, values to be sorted out. Okay. So the systems we have in this country actually have never really don't work to do that. Right? I mean, if I asked you right now just to close your eyes for a minute, you can do that. And I say to you the word, picture what democracy looks like. Now, open your eyes. A couple of you, what did you see? What was your picture? What was it? Scandinavia. I can't hear you. Scandinavia. Why Scandinavia? Uh, because What's the picture? True democracy. True democracy is versus a republic. But tell me what the picture is. What's the image? What's the thing you see? A cohesive community. So you see uh, cohesion. Cohesion of working for the greater good of, of them all. Okay. Yes. I just saw lots of faces just kind of moving around. Like actually, just kind of my mind, just lots of people and faces. Like in democracy, I look at people and faces. Okay. Any other images? Yeah. The town, the town meeting. The town meeting. Others? Wow. We don't have an imagination of democracy. We're in trouble in this Why? country. Huh? Smiling. Smiling. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Well, here's the thing. Uh, a lot of times and when I ask people about this question, things that usually come up are, just as you said, lots of different faces. People think about processes and they start thinking about the town hall. They think about gatherings that people can come together in. But the reality is those systems that are in place in this country that are kind of like the infrastructure of democracy can't handle the public that we have now, right? And you think about what they were designed for, right? The New England Town Hall, right, frame that we have was not a place that was designed for everyone. It was designed for particular communities, communities that were actually designed to keep certain people out. There were communities that people joined because they had a certain, uh, shared sense of values and oftentimes religion, right, that actually unified them they build a process that allows them to come together, and the outsiders are the outsiders. So that system of the town hall and things like that doesn't work when you actually have a different belief, which is to say everybody's in. And everybody is 10 million people, or 15 million people. So then what does a public process look like in that? And that's the challenge that we're actually faced with right now. When you look at our presidential election going on, we had a town hall meeting. You know, we like, we like to call that, in, in, in our field, we like to call it, you know, uh, democracy is theater, right? Because that's what it is. It's not really a town hall meeting. It's a piece of theater. And we, as an audience, are supposed to appreciate it. So cities stepping into this, right, realizing this thing, uh, have actually started to turn to data, right, as a vehicle to try to understand the public. If we can't create rooms that we can get 10 million people in, or a process that can have everybody have a voice, 
let's use data really as a mechanism for helping us understand the public. Right. So you have this big call, the call for big data, right? Pushed a lot by tech companies who are putting lots of money into helping cities think about how to actually use informatics and other systems to let the city know where the public is on anything. So you have things like urban mechanic systems, like these up here, where you know they'll they'll design apps for your phones so that when you drive down the street, if you hit a pothole, it'll actually send a message back to the city that says, "Oh, there's a pothole right there because it's geolocated, right?" Or you have some kind of crowdsourcing opportunities that allow people to tap into things. Or as a, you know, you're, or you're driving down the Mass Pike, and now it's telling you know it's recording where you go when you get on when you get off leading to a system where they might actually start to have user tax depending on the amount of time you actually use the road. So what's happening in cities, uh, and I don't know how many of you watch like these, uh, this actually started to really show up in the, like the police dramas on TV, the notion of a dashboard so you can see everything that's going on, right? That's the new thing. You go into any mayor's office right now, there are four screens up so they can look at and see the information and the numbers. Right, around all kinds of things. But the numbers don't tell you everything. Right? And it's really questionable if they tell you the things that are most important. So, and I like to illustrate this by this uh, image here, uh, which is a personal story. So back in a long time ago, uh, I was actually in Nicaragua, and I was, uh, well, why I was there isn't really important. But I was walking, and I actually fell. I had an accident. I was with a group of people and really hurt myself bad. And I ended up in the hospital. And actually a year before that, I had surgery on my neck and they had actually taken out, uh, I had a chipped uh, uh, disc between my C3 and C4 of my neck. And they had taken that out and it was all fine. When I fell, I actually lost feeling, uh, feeling in my legs. I couldn't move very much anymore. You know, after I got to the hospital, they were trying to figure out what was going on. So they did x-rays of me. They tried to figure out what was on. Uh, I was actually, they had moved me to Costa Rica at this time. Finally decided to medevac me back to the United States. Uh, and uh, the surgeon who worked on my neck uh, was there. They figured out it wasn't my neck, but they did bone scans and they did x-rays. Uh, and MRIs and everything of me. And they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And they ended up sending me home and said, rest is all you really need, you know. Must be some muscle thing over time. And I managed to be home, I had some feeling, and then one day a friend of mine is calling me up and says, hey, I know this person who's an orthopedic surgeon who's just kind of moved into holistic medicine, she's moving to Boston, you should go see her. And I went to see her, uh, hobbled into her office. She takes me into the examination room, she lays me on the table, and she proceeds to touch me all over my body. And in four months, with who knows how many doctors and specialists, she was the first person to do that. Everyone else was looking at data about my body, but was not actually engaging with my body. And from that experience, she was able to take both things, the data, her actual engagement, and begin to understand what was actually happening with my body and the therapy that I would need to actually get to whole health. Well, in some sense, our reliance on big data as a vehicle to bring the public together is the same kind of thing. If we only rely on the data, we are actually not relying on what the public can only tell us by us being directly engaged with it. Right. And back to that thing that I said at the very beginning, those voices actually are essential for us being able to do that. So the problem here, you know, I always say like, well, the counterpoint to big data is big democracy, right? We need to invest in the idea of democracy just like we're investing in the idea of data and technology. And the problem with democracy in this country is no one's business, but everyone wants to use it for their own purpose. And what I mean by that is, people will tell you, oh, well, we had a public meeting and we got approval to do this. But no one's really in those things saying that our goal is actually to strengthen the public's capacity for self-governance. Right? 
That's not what we do now. All right? Our issues of public engagement are really about just getting some information from the public in general, but it's not really about strengthening that. And I'll say a little more about what I mean by that. So, um, what I, one way to think about this really requires a kind of definition of what democracy means. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a definition. It's actually, I stole it from a friend of mine who wrote this about 30 something years ago about community, so I adapted it to be about democracy. But it goes like this, like community or democracy exists when people who are interdependent struggle with the traditions that bind them and the interests that separate them so they can realize a future that's an improvement on the past. Now I want to talk about this a little bit in detail. So the first part it requires, as he says, people who are interdependent who are going to struggle. Now by interdependent, we know what it means. If there's some relationship that requires people to rely on each other, right? And that can happen because of spatially, economics, a whole set of things. But it's not just that they're interdependent, but that they are actually able to struggle together. And what do they have to struggle with? Well, two things. Traditions that bind them, right? You might know what, I mean, what he means by that? Traditions that bind you? What do, you, I mean, what do you think some of those traditions might be that bind us as a nation right now? Voting. Voting. That's one tradition that binds us. What's another? Religion. 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 It's actually interesting we're in this uh, talk that's about black spaces. Race. Racism binds us, right? Our patriarchal nature binds us. There's so many things that actually binds us as a public that keeps us from imagining and thinking about other things we can do. The Constitution. Right? The Constitution does bind us. It does bind us in some ways. That is the right, right? So one thing is, he says people have to be willing to struggle with the traditions that bind them, but also the interests that separate them. Now, the interesting thing about the interests that separate people is that interests are either bad or good. They're just things that people have. And it is okay for people to have different interests, right? But somehow they have to figure out how to negotiate those different interests. So those traditions, there are traditions that are holding us back from actually being able to do that work around stroking around interests that separate us. But the goal of all this is not just to be, you know, have democracy. The goal of this is to have an equitable improvement on the past. And why I think this is really important is that oftentimes when we think about things like democracy or public engagement, moving forward in the future, we have very lofty ideas that we're moving forward, right? But this measure is really quite simple. We're making equitable improvements in what was right behind us. And that's something you can measure, that's something you can see, that's something we let you know that you're actually making progress. So if you take the whole quote, right, again, that, you know, uh, let me put the whole quote back up, or you can see it this way, that community exists when people who are interdependent struggle with the traditions that bind them and the interests that separate them so that they can realize a future that is an equitable improvement on the past. So when you take that whole quote, it leads me to say there's actually one thing that we really need that we don't have. And that is the containers in which that peaceful struggle can actually happen. That's what we don't have, right? The spaces and the places in which people can actually engage in that kind of struggle. We are a bifurcated society, the whole world is. We look at things in terms of interest, that tend to separate people. And we don't have necessarily spaces that are set up in our communities and in our day-to-day -day lives that said, actually, this is a place to figure that out together and to figure that out peacefully. We are in a kind of zero-sum frame of the public right now. We need to be in a different one that says we can actually, there's enough here for everyone if we can actually allow ourselves to actually struggle through this together. And it is a struggle. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard work. So part of 
setting up such containers actually has to, requires us to say, well, what is it that the public should be involved in? And I want to name like five things that the public actually is it's essential for the public to be involved in. So one of those is this thing is uh, framing, right? I'll put this all up here. So in order for there to actually be democratic processes around planning or anything else, there are actually five different ways I like to look at the public can actually be doing this. One is the public can be involved in actually framing the issue it should be. And framing is probably the most important thing there is, right? Because how you frame something <coughs> says a lot about what the possible options are for solutions. And oftentimes, what we do with the public in our society now is things have already been framed. We hand them to them to make lim choices among limited, limited things without really having really talked to everyone to understand the problem. So framing is really about comple completely understanding the complexity of a problem and, and building a frame around it so you actually know what you're dealing with. And you can't get at that if you don't have everyone or at least experiences from different kinds of people who are living through something to understand it. So it's kind of like we uh, did this campaign in, in Boston around transportation. Uh, and I won't go into the details of it, but one of the things we did was actually get the city to agree that the public should actually frame the transportation plan. The public should set what the goals are, not the city. And we did it through this whole thing. And then, you know, the question they kept saying was, how do you get the public to do that? The public doesn't know enough to frame it. And you know, our response was, well, actually they do because they live it every day, right? The thing is, we haven't figured out how to actually get that lived experience out and how to get it out from everyone. And we did it through this thing called a question campaign, right? And the idea was to get people to basically donate the question they had about transportation in Boston in the future. Now the interesting thing about that is two things when we did it. One is people were actually amazed but no one ever asked them what their question is about something. Right? They may ask them to answer a question someone else has said is important. But to turn it around and say, well, what's your question? Right? The other thing is there's it it eliminates so many barriers to entry because anyone and everyone has a question about their lived experience. And so all of a sudden, we were able to open the door up. The language issue went away, right? Because you didn't have to speak English to have a question. You just had to have a question, right? Age went away as a barrier. Our job, which is very simple, is just to make it possible for people to donate the question by not having to do anything other than what they do in their daily life. So they could do it in the church, they could do it in the barbershop, they could do it at the corner where they live. You make that possible and all of a sudden people can do it. And those questions, and I won't go through the process of it, actually ended up framing the goals for the transportation plan, like putting them together, organizing, and so on and so forth. So anyway, framing is really important. For me, it's the most important thing at the top level to get the public in. But so are other things. The other thing that the public has a role in is actually ideating, right? So once you frame a problem, you go out to the public, you could say like, you can't go to the public, the public should be involved in saying, well, what are ideas? What are ways we can go about doing this? The other is the public can be involved in actually prioritizing among ideas that have been put out there. Then they can be involved in selecting what actually we're going to do. And the last thing is they can actually be involved in doing it and monitoring our success. Now, we have lots of experiments going on in this country with each of these things, right? Participatory budgeting, right? It's a way of the public being involved in selecting, right? Because they actually make a decision about something, how it should be financed, right? And actually putting money on something that they really want to have happen. But there are lots of others that people are experimenting with. The problem with these experiments is they're small and they're contained, and they're not actually dealing with the much broader issues of the complexity of who we are as a people. And so, I believe we can get there, but we get there by actually having some design principles that we have to hold on to if we're actually doing public engagement work. So I want to go through a little bit of those, some of those design principles and talk to you about. 
and then uh, six. Wow. I usually don't do bullet points, but I didn't know how else to do this. Uh, so, uh, let me name these off and I want to talk about each of them individually. The first, they are design for the margins, design for equity, design for systemic change, design for collaboration, design for analog and digital participation, and design for healing. So design for the margins, what do I mean by that? So our general approach around designing anything is to say, can we make this work for the most people possible? And that takes us to say, let's design for the middle. All right? But when you design to serve the most people who are in the middle, this bell curve if you want, you actually continue to push the margins further down because they continue to be missed. The funny thing is, if you flip it and say, let's design for the margins, you end up actually covering people in the middle. Why? Because people who are at the margins are actually living with the failures of the system that actually people in the middle have figured out some ways around. So if you deal with the failures of that system, you actually strengthen them. And that's why by designing first to serve people who are at the margins, you actually create greater opportunity for everyone. Now the problem with dealing with the margins is that the margins keep expanding, right? So it's not saying you've got to do everyone, but you have to have this sensibility. You have to answer the question, who's marginalized by this process? Can we at least try to get some of those folks and design this so it works for them, right? But it'll keep pushing. Great example. In the, um, Right after World War II in Minneapolis, there was this whole uh, effort, I shouldn't say effort, but there was this center for vets who were re returning. And one of the issues was people were in wheelchairs, right? And there was a service center for them. And the person who was running the service center got, you know, concerned because people kind of couldn't make it up the curb. So he got the city to actually cut out the curb, right? And this has, and that kind of worked, it was kind of cool, and they started doing a little bit more of that, and then he actually moved to Berkeley and uh, started pushing this idea of curb cuts as a vehicle to take care of people who are in wheelchairs. And it started to spread, right? And it started to be a thing, now, it didn't spread easily, right? I mean, there were places in this country where people, you know, uh, as part of the uh, ADA movement, would go out with sledgehammers and actually break up curb corners because the city wasn't doing it, right? So it wasn't necessarily that it always went smoothly. But in some places, you know, it did. The city decided and adopted and said, this is something that really is important to happen. Now, everywhere, curb cuts are there. And who does it benefit? Hmm? Who benefits from it? Everyone. 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 Bicyclists, people pushing strollers. It doesn't really matter. You know, the mail carrier has a little cart. You know, you know, it's just like it benefits so much, but it wasn't designed to benefit everyone. It was designed for a particular population that was marginalized by the structure that was in place. That was failing for other people. The people who were making them doing their workarounds, right? They had the ability to do their workarounds. But folks in wheelchairs didn't. Now, the interesting thing about it is you put them in and out. What, what have you noticed about curb cuts lately? Have you noticed that they've changed? Have you noticed the change in curb cuts? What? It's smoother. Actually, they're not smoother. Something's going on. It's the new ADA regulations. Right. And what, are they, what, what about it? Um, it's like ripped. The ripped. Yeah, the ripped. Why? No. No. So blind people can know when they're at the curb. So blind people can know when they're at the curb. Because when they just had a slight, uh, it was hard to tell. With the raised bumps now, you can tell. Another margin, right? Another adaptation. So this is what I mean about the margin keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. You have to keep working on it and working on it and working on it. It's not something you saw. It is something you commit to engage with continually. Um, design for equity. So 
everything's an interesting thing. Lots of people have ideas about how you do it, you don't do it, but the importance of it to me doesn't need to be questioned. So I'm just gonna say, look, that's, that's the goal, right? It's saying this whole thing about democracy, we're looking for equitable improvements of the past. Right? So the thing, though, that makes this kind of tricky for people, right, when you start to look at the question of design for equity, it is not necessarily saying that you know what the equitable outcome is, but you're going to pay attention to the outcomes to see if they are equitable. And if not, you're then going to adjust them. Equity is a goal to reach for. You have to do very particular kinds of things in order to get there. Right? But it is something that if we don't hold it up front as really a frame that we're going to use in looking at everything we do, who we invite into the room, right? we won't get there. I can't tell you how many meetings. I was just in a, in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, actually, and someone was telling me about a meeting they were in in Boston that had been called to look at this particular neighborhood. Lots of folks who are movers and shakers not one person of color in the room. Now how, in this day and age, in a place like Boston, do you get away with that? You get away with it because equity is actually not a frame at the front of what you're doing. It may be in your language. I'm not talking about can you talk about equity and say it, but is it actually embedded in how you think about what you're doing? Designing for systemic change. Now, oftentimes, what I mean by this one, about really paying attention to systemic change, really means not just looking at what's the thing that we are addressing here, but what actually are the things underneath that are leading to it. You know, it's the old iceberg notion, right? You know, you look at an iceberg, it only covers this much. You know, you see this much of it above the water. And if you say, well, all I have to do is just go around this little piece right here, now, you sink your ship because the iceberg is much bigger underneath than it is at the top. Most problems that people are starting to engage with, they're engaged with, the public's engaged with, they're dealing with the tip of the iceberg, but it is the broader underneath piece that they need to be understanding, right? They need to understand the system that is actually there and begin to make changes there in order for things to be different. So, one of the things that's actually interesting in this, in this campaign we did, um, the mayor's office in Boston, I can say this, the mayor had changed, right? We had a mayor been in place for 20 something years, it was his city. We had a new mayor, elected, dark, more populist kind of mayor came into office. And we wanted to do this question campaign image, and we wanted to do, you know, we were going to do a social media blast thing around it. You know, we had an idea about how to reach people, different contributors we were going to have, different outlets we were going to use, uh, just really a, a ground score around this. The city media department, communications department, was still operating as if it was 1960, right? That what you do is you send out press releases in order to move something. Right? And so when we came with our plan, their first thought was, somebody actually said this, we want to approve every tweet that goes out. And we said, good luck with that, right? That's just not gonna happen, right? This is a different kind of system. You need to be thinking differently. You have to shift the system you're under to actually make a change and bring people in the door. So if we had used the system the way they wanted to, which works, and they still use it, right? Sending out press releases to the ethnic presses and this, and just using that old system, we wouldn't have gotten very far. But we used a new system, right? We really looked at changing underlying what the communication infrastructure was in the city and how it thought about communications in order to reach not what is normally for the city in these kinds of intense campaigns, you know, 500 people showing up for a meeting, but instead 7,000 people participating, all right? And you do that by, again, realizing you've got to make some systemic changes 
and the systems that we always use in order to get there. A couple of others, and I'll just say them real quick. One is designing for collaboration, right? If you build this container and you run other people in it, you also have to design and create those processes that allow people to continue to work together over time. And that's hard because almost everything around us is not designed to do that. Right? It takes time for it to do that. The other is this thing about design for analog and digital. And this is a big one for me. So here's what's going on right now. You know what I said before that cities are really turning into technology and big data? The biggest push in this country around public participation is digital strategies. Right? That's it. There are so many efforts right now and investments going on. How do we do public participation digitally? And it's great. It's wonderful. It's helpful. But it will never get you everyone. And if you take the idea of design for the margins, you will think about that differently. And so what we say is, you actually have to design for both. You have to design for the analog world and the digital world, and not keep them separate. That they have to be able to communicate with each other all the time in an ongoing way. And that becomes really hard. So for example, if you have an online process that allows people to donate questions, and you're having community meetings where people don't use online processes, how do you let people know questions came in online? How do you make a commitment to doing that? Right? So one time we did this in Cambridge, we would have these community events. We actually printed out every question on wall-sized posters around the room and actually did walkthroughs with people, right? To get these questions. And the point is you say, well that's making sense but what it meant to people to say like okay I'm not online but I can see what's happening there I am part of that and those people who are online saying I can see what's happening in this room and I'm part of that really starts to knit people together in a way that's really important and you stop break and start to break down these walls that we have. The last one I'll talk about is designing for healing. I don't know how many public meetings many of you have been in but the reality is the public in this country is really has been traumatized by the processes that we use. People have given up. Right? Not only have they given up, people in agencies have given up. Right? Talk to anyone who sits in a planning department or anything and you say, okay, now you gotta do a public meeting, and the first thing you do is their shoulders drop and they go, oh my god, we gotta do a public meeting. Right? There's no imagination to it, there's no energy around it, right? Because everybody's been harmed by the process. So as we are designing these new containers for people to come together, we have to also pay attention to how do we heal, right? Create the context for healing so that people can let go of their trauma of the past and start to participate and imagine that something new can happen. You can't get there without healing, right? Just, it's impossible. So we have to kind of start to create also that in our design. So again, as I said, you know, our, the challenge right now and public participation in democracy is really how are we going to create new opportunities, what I call these containers, right, that are going to allow the public to be in peaceful struggle together. And that these design principles I see as really key to how one starts thinking about those. I'm not expecting anyone to say, okay, we got all those, we know how to do it. You know, to have fluency in all of them. But take one. Work it the next time you're actually trying to build something. The next time, add another one. Keep doing it over and over again because we're all trying to learn about this. Right? Uh, we're all, and we need to learn about it together. And not just from here, other places in the world are experimenting. And there's so much we can learn from other places about what does it take to engage people. Right? People have been doing extraordinary stuff in Latin America and other countries, right? And really about getting people involved. So, I want to leave with this. I have this belief, right, this thing I used to say that kind of every effort to change the world for the better begins with someone asking why something is so, right, and then raising their own experience up into the world. And part of what we have to do is create that opportunity for that to happen. And, um, yeah, you know, to create that opportunity for that to happen for everyone. So, um, with that, I want to leave you with this. Uh, keep, you know, I, 
when I give these talks, I always think about, I feel, you know, I must feel like a downer, right? I don't mean to feel like a downer, right? There's a lot going on. All this stuff, I think, is possible, things we can do. That's why I'm saying it, because I know people have the creative energy to do it, right? It's ours and yours to take. So there used to be this guy who used to ride the trains with the guitar and wrote a whole bunch of songs named Woody Guthrie. Uh, he was an activist and a labor organizer. Uh, he had this saying, and I just, I need it with you, which is, you know, take it easy in the world, but just make sure you take it. When you live in the transition space, you have to live with the thing you're changing as you're making incremental progress toward changing it. And you have to find peace with both at the same time and actually continue to have energy to do the change. And that's a, that's a tough space to be in. You know? But if we don't talk about it and have language of recognizing it in other people, because we want people to be all in, all this, all that, all that. So we put people in these kind of ridiculous positions that aren't true to who they, what's happening inside of them at all. So. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I think, yes. yes.